Our strong quarterly earnings results continue to be driven by sound operational and financial performance from our diversified business units in the U.S. and internationally. During the second quarter, we achieved a number of important milestones. In June, we closed on our previously announced acquisition of the Joe Corley Detention Center in Montgomery County, Texas, for $65 million. The center was previously owned by the county and houses ICE and U.S. Marshals detainees. We managed the center under a contract with the county, and this is one of the best performing management contracts with annual revenues of approximately $27 million. The acquisition of the center has allowed us to secure long-term benefit of this contract and is expected to generate returns on investment consisting with our own facilities. <laughs> Further, we believe this important acquisition significantly improves our competitive position to pursue expansion opportunities given the ongoing need for federal fed space in this region of the country. Early in the quarter, we took important steps to restructure our balance sheet. In April, we amended our billion-dollar senior credit facility at favorable rates and more flexible terms. The restructuring of our credit facility was preceded by the March offering of $300 million in senior unsecured notes at a yield of 5 and one eighth percent, a historically low rate for our company. The important steps have given us more flexibility as we continue to pursue accretive opportunities for new organic development projects and potential asset purchases. These opportunities are expected to drive growth for our company as we continue to return value to our shareholders. Today we announced our third quarter dividend of 50 cents per share consistent with our prior guidance. As we have expressed to you in the past, our board and our management team remain focused on the careful evaluation of our allocation of capital to enhance shareholder value. We remain committed to increasing our dividend payout in our adjusted funds from operations through the continued organic growth of the company. In line with that commitment, we expect to increase our quarterly dividend payout ratio to approximately 75% of AFFO, or 53 to 55 cents per share in the fourth quarter of this year. Our recently completed refinancing, the potential reactivization of idle facilities and new organic opportunities will give us the flexibility to return a higher portion of our funds available for distribution to our shareholders. With respect to the outlook for our industry, we continue to be optimistic regarding several new opportunities and we are currently pursuing. Our most immediate potential catalysts are the prospective reactivation of our current inventory of idle facilities, which total approximately 6,000 beds. Specifically, as it relates to our current idle facilities and in inventory, we are currently participating in known public procurements in California, Michigan, and at the federal level. These procurements are expected to have contract awards announced this year and next year and may result in the reactivation of several of our idle facilities. Further, we are exploring a number of non-public opportunities that relate to both new project development as well as potential asset purchases. We believe that our company is well positioned to benefit from these important opportunities. We also believe that our company has attractive investment characteristics which are underpinned by our robust real estate portfolio of company-owned and leased facilities. Our company profile has evolved over several years, during which time we have developed and financed dozens of new detention and correctional facilities for federal and state government clients. We currently own or lease approximately 70% of our facilities and 60% of our beds worldwide, and approximately 60% of our total revenues are generated by our company-owned and company lease facilities. Our owned and leased real estate portfolio encompasses approximately 8 million square feet in diversified facilities located on more than 4,000 acres of land across the United States. We have stable and sustainable income through increasingly longer-term contract arrangements. 
We have a diversified base of investment grade government customers with multiple individual contract arrangements with no single customer contract representing more than 5% of our revenues. We have historically enjoyed solid occupancy rates in the mid to high 90s and strong customer retention rates in excess of 90%. Our long-term assets require relatively low levels of maintenance capex. As we have discussed historically, our maintenance capex requirements of approximately $25 million to $30 million annually are less than half of our annual depreciation expense of $70 million. Now I would like to turn the call over to Brian Evans to review our financial performance now. Okay, we'll stop it there. Um, I guess we'll go with legacy first. Legacy, did anything stand out to you that you heard uh, the CEO, what's his name, uh, Mr. Zoli, had to say? It's very interesting to me that they can so blatantly use a word like enjoy. In joy, the unfair incarceration of human beings for profit. If this doesn't sound like the old South and the original institution of slavery, I don't know what does. I was standing under the flag two weeks ago. What was that, Max? I was standing under their flag just a couple of weeks ago, if you remember, uh, when I stood underneath the uh, Confederate flag here in Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, we protested the whole Trayvon Martin ruling, but I was there for abolitionism. But things, there were some things that, that stuck out for me, like the key words that they used, as she said, enjoy. Another one was organic growth. Yeah, I wrote you that what, down. What, yeah, organic growth, you know what that means? That means you make it illegal to be homeless. You make it illegal uh, to do this, that, or anything else, and you have an organic growth. You have a self-replicating population, like addicts, for instance. Or you take money out of certain areas that prevent those things so it flourishes, and that's what they call organic growth. And then he said 53 to 50 cents per share for the fourth quarter, right? But I hear him later. You'll catch this later when one of them mentions that they expect growth rates up to 73 per, uh, cents per share. Where I come from, that's a 50% increase. In one year. Share. Yeah, that's outrageous. On, on what? Selling human bodies and, and, and forcing them to make commercial goods. And um, the, the reactivation of 6,000 beds and the procurement of property, private property, are we going to be using eminent domain laws now to build prisons, man? Is that what they're talking about? Because the government works with the prison systems, and they have this thing called the uh, mandatory procurement clause, where all government offices and facilities have to purchase their goods from prisons. By law, they have to purchase their goods from prisons. And, and then they tried to change that law for the private prisons to be more uh, compatible or be able to compete in that market more, Bush and Cheney did. So what they did was they put it in the hands of the uh, the Federal Prison Association. I forget what it's called. What is it uh, again there, Scotty, the Federal Prisons? Oh, the Bureau of Prisons, BOP. Yeah, the whole yeah, – okay. Well, they put it in their hands, and what they did was decided they would make the decision on who gets the bids. So the prison decides who gets the bids. And when you heard him say bids, he was talking about they they are making their approval for those purchases of private property and reactivating probably uh, prisons that are with below standard and health codes in order to get more prisoners. Wow. One of the other things uh, when you mentioned organic growth and, and the things that lead to that, like, you know, uh, uh, the job loss, but let's not forget that for every enslaved person who they give a job to, that's one less job for you out here on the outside. So then you'll be, you know, the cycle begins. Okay, I can't find employment. They couldn't food assistance. So what am I going to do? 
to survive. Oh, I guess I'll have to sell some drugs or a prostitute or, or, you know, go break into somebody's house. So they're, they're actually creating the conditions for that organic. Indeed growth. they are. Now, this is a really interesting thing because what we're listening to is the GEO group, correct? The GEO yes. group, yes. The GEO group. Now, the GEO group's parent company is Whack and Hub Corporation. Who's been funded by who? The American Legislative Exchange Council, who is behind some of the toughest sentencing laws that have ever been created on the books. Like sentencing, nonviolent offenders, the three strikes rule. So, of course, they are creating the conditions. They have the law that has to create the conditions to do this. The American Legislative Exchange Council is also behind uh, a lot of the uh, anti-immigrant reform because they have quotas for building correctional facilities, incarcerating more of the immigrant population. So this thing is working on several levels against any people who are supposed to be uh, the, the this free labor force that they need so they can continue to enjoy their profits and the organic exploitation of people. Mm-hmm. One of the things so you mentioned. All the way up to the, I'm sorry. So go ahead, all the way up to, the, to the White House, as I was associating before with Dick Cheney and, and Alberto Gonzalez, they were just two that got busted. Now, in the trial with these guys, the judge disappeared, never to be seen again. That's how that ended. That's why they never went to prison. The judge disappeared. This is the type of country we're living in. Now, I just want to make a quote. The jail population grew to 2 million by the year 2000. In 1990, it was 1 million. Ten years ago, there was only five private prisons in the country with a population of 2,000 inmates. Now, there are 100 with 62,000 inmates, and it's expected that by the coming decade, the number will be 360,000, according to reports. So what has happened over the last 10 years? Why are there so many prisoners? And you can't tell me that the president, the White House right now, doesn't know what's going on because he's a constitutional lawyer. He's fully aware of what's going on. Well, this I'll, is treason at the highest levels, if you ask me. Well, also we need to point out, and I want to get back to something Legacy pointed out, but we should also point out that currently the U.S. Justice Department is fighting in court, in the federal court, to keep prisoners who are mostly African descended behind bars who were sentenced under the discriminatory uh, racist drug laws talking about the crack cocaine versus the powder. Now everybody ha- that has been involved with this case including uh, members of Congress have said that it was racist, that it was unfair, and that these prisoners should be sentenced under the new guidelines that the president signed into law himself, reducing it from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1 is still a huge disparity. Uh, uh, but so he knows, he knows, and they're fighting to keep these prisoners behind bars, which is estimated to be about 10,000 human beings. Okay. And, and and to touch upon uh, what Legacy was talking about, you know, he mentioned on that call about their tremendous growth opportunity in Texas. Where is Texas? Texas is a border state where, you know, with an increasing Hispanic and Latino uh, population. Indeed. Mm-hmm. So, uh, again, and people need to wake up um I don't see too many of our uh, brown brothers and sisters who, there are a few, because there are a few that are members of, you know, new abolitionists, excuse me, who follow this radio program, but who are also members of the Facebook group, Move to Abolish 21st Century Slavery. But as far as their big organizations uh, that they have, I don't really see this being an issue. I know they're working on immigration reform and stuff like this, but... I mean, why aren't they out on the forefront, you know, on this issue? They are being enslaved. They are probably one of the fastest growing, you know, of a prison slavery population. And, you know, they're not just uh, doing time anymore because they could just literally use their bodies. They did that for a long time. But they, the company now, commercial companies across the globe are having slaves make their goods and provide their services. Companies like Starbucks and McDonald's and Burger King and Kmart and all of these global entities now are going from using third world slave labor to using real slave labor in prison.